um, we've been in church a long time. Now, Graham knows me, and he and I will have a talk. I love that man. I love that man. I love Paul Graham. But again today, as I did on last night, I need to express my congratulations and acclamation to the leadership team of this church and what you have pulled off here on this lot. But it could not have been done without you. And I commend you as well that this spot that I walked by morning after morning, my wife and I moved around the corner on, I guess it must have been on in October of 1997, we moved on to Pleasant View Court off of Pleasant View Drive, the first street you pass as you come in. Uh, well, you pass Heatherstone, then, then uh, Pleasant View uh, Drive. And we walked by this almost vacant lot. There was this shell of a church that had never been completed. And I never thought that God would do what he has done. So it's the first time I've had a chance to welcome you to my neighborhood. a changing neighborhood demographically. This neighborhood is becoming very African and you need to understand that. Um, but God has brought you here at this time so he thinks you're up to it. The Caucasian community is dwindling African-American community here is staying about the same, but the, the community from West Africa is the growing community in my neighborhood. So maybe you need to go on now and get out your dashikis and yashikis and mashikis and draw them here. Enough of this foolishness, I'm here to preach. Let us pray. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Seventh-day Adventist people, just by the nature of the faith, the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, the Seventh-day Adventist teaching, the Seventh-day Adventist way of thinking is intellectual and informational. We are gatherers of facts and beliefs and systems. And through the information that God has trusted us, we have become sharp and aware. We are sensitized to issues of right and wrong. We've stored up the word of God. We have discernment. We, we have a sense. Even uh, Adventists are so biblically astute that even when someone is preaching, we, we wince if something is said that isn't quite right. Because we have the truth. And so the longer you're in this church, stay with me, I'm setting you up. The longer we're in this church, the more, the more cognitive we become, the more sin sensitive we become, the more aware we become that error, that, that, that lack of truth, that, that, that something is wrong. And, 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 and so that's why when, when we sin, we sin knowingly.
Adventists don't make mistakes in the same way everybody else does. We just decide we gonna sin and we just sin. Because we know the truth. Why y'all sitting there all quiet? We know right from wrong. We have the books. We have the old woman, all those red books and black books and, and we know the doctrines and, and we know the prophecies and, and we can explain stuff that nobody else can explain. In fact, we explain stuff that does not need to be explained. My point is, I'm setting you up, my point is that Satan has to be sharp to fool us because we know so much. We've given up the drinking of liquor. We've given up the drinking of liquor. My prayer is that they've given up the drinking of liquor. We've laid down the cigarettes. Marijuana has no appeal to us. We know these are open sins. We don't, we don't do open sins. Adultery, fornication, and stuff like that. We, we know that's wrong. We, uh, we, 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 we see the devil coming when he's coming. That's why if we go on and do it, it's not because we were fooled. We just decided we were going to do it. Can I get a witness in this place? And so Satan has to think shrewdly and deeply and incisively and continuously and day and night to draw us in, to trick us, to, to, to deceive us that, that we, may, we, we may not be saved because we're armed with information and Bible and facts and prophecies. We, we almost know, we, we, we people are worried about the Lord coming. We know he ain't coming yet. Ain't been no plagues. We know that. We got time to sin because we got the schedule. I'm setting you up. And so, and so Satan, if he's going to fool Seventh-day Adventists, brother, he's got to think long and early so that when certain things come to pass, pass we are not aware of his movements. Satan has to backdoor Seventh-day Adventist people. And in that process, catch us just where we never thought we'd be caught. Do I have your attention so far? The book of Revelation unveils a magnificently conceived and highly ingeniously deceptive form of sin and you have to read the revelation book to see how God sets this thing up revelation 1 of course is the introduction to the book revelation 2 and 3 the seven churches revelation 4 and 5 the unveiling of the heavenly scene that God has in charge Revelation 6 and 7, the unfolding of the, of the, of the seven uh, uh, seals, and, and then in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, the, the seven trumpets, and then chapter 12, the, the, the woman and the church and the, and the wilderness and identifying God's people, those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And, and all through those first chapters, hear me, all through those first chapters of Revelation, Satan's subtle move is not seen, but it's there. A hint is given in Revelation 12. You're turning there. Turn your phone on. Do something. <laughs> Revelation 12. Uh, the, the, a, little, a little hint is given of, of, Satan's, of Satan's way of dealing with, with, with smart people, Bible reading people, people who know truth, people who have read the books. A little hint is given, sis. Are you with me? A little hint is given as to how Satan works. And, it, and, and there's nothing mentioned here specifically about any sin, no, no fornication, no, no drinking, no, no smoking, no carousing. It's just one word used there that just catches the mind. Revelation 12 and verse 9. You remember the drama there, there's the woman, the church, and then she has the baby and the red dragon, the devil waits on her. And then, and then verse nine, verse nine, so the great dragon was cast out. 
the serpent of old, every name the Bible can think to call him, they call him in this one verse, the devil and Satan. Who, what's the next word? Talk to me, what's the next word? Who deceives? See, you didn't even get it. Satan's method of getting to us is to deceive us. And his greatest deception, hey, his greatest deception is to make you think you're all right when you're not. See, our problem is not smoking and drinking and carousing and these things. Our problem is the problem of the Pharisees and the scribes who thought they were so righteous, Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying people who put Jesus on the cross, but they thought because of their tithe paying and Sabbath keeping and counting of commandments, they were automatically saved and did not know that the devil owned their hearts. Is anybody still awake? And so what he does is deceive and his greatest deception, let me say it again, Audrey Levison, his greatest deception is to make you think you're doing fine when you're not. This is why I'm so excited, Pastor, Pastor Graham, about this, about this prayer vigil this church has been on, about all this praying you've been doing. Nothing like prayer to give you a picture of yourself, because we found out last night that prayer is falah. It is breaking you open and exposing you. Prayer finally gets you to tell you the truth about yourself. Prayer will not let you lie if you keep on praying. Praying will make you point your finger at yourself in the mirror of yourself and call yourself by the right name. That's what prayer does, so I'm glad you're praying. Prayer removes the veil of deception. Prayer with God will not let you keep on saying that what you're doing wrong is right. And so, he deceives. But it's not till we get to chapter 13 that the deception is found. And when I read it, my brother, what are you doing, taking pictures of me? Okay. Mm. So when I get to chapter 13, well, you, know, you know, these days everything goes Facebook, this book, that book. I want to look right. Come on, Sister Wright, fix me up. Did she fix me up? Come on now. Yes, sir. My wife brought these clothes for me. Somebody say amen. amen. Fix the old man up. Now, now, we're in Revelation 13. When you get to Revelation 13, you then see, my brother, you see that the deception, you got to listen to me, folk, the deception that's in chapter 13 of Revelation starts in Genesis. I'm going to show it to you. Here it is. Here it is. Sis read it. What's your name, Avanti? Yeah, that's you. Did a good job. Good job. Revelation 13, here it is. Watch it now. Watch it now. And he, verse 15, and he granted power to give breath to the beast, breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. Now, I purposely did not assign her verse 17 because I wanted you to help me set them up. Verse 17, here it is. And that no one may what? Oh, okay. That no one may do what? It seems so subtle, Bernard. Satan says, how am I going to get them Adventists? They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't carouse. They don't do pot. They don't do none of that stuff. In church on Sabbath, returning 10% of their income. Some of them even eat Vegelink. Some of them even would eat that. Just weeds and seeds is all they eat. <laughs> How am I 
don't get to people whose minds are that clear and sharp. How will I get to them? But it says here, he comes up with an ingenious plan. Uh, praise team, you're outstanding today. Ingenious plan. He says, I'm not going to worry about trying to get them to do that stuff. I'm going to put them in a position where they have to make a choice between me and their house. Are you getting it, Doc? He's getting it. They won't be able to buy and sell. Now think about it. Did anybody do any buying this week? Go on, get your hand up. Get your hand up. Put your hand down, you're lying. You know you bought something, chewing gum, something. You bought something. <laughs> Stocking, something. You bought something, socks. You bought something, lunch. You bought lunch, didn't you buy lunch? Get them hands up again. How many bought something this week? Yeah, I need some honesty in this place. You know you bought something. We say, I ain't got no money. You borrowed money and you bought something this week. So subtle. Buy and sell. Let's dig into it. See one of the most powerful things about being in this country, the United States of America, is owning stuff. Yeah, owning stuff. And the devil created the problem in Genesis. Should we go to Genesis? But keep your finger in Revelation 13, Genesis, Genesis. I told you I was setting you up, Genesis, here it is. And this thing, when you read your Bible through last year, this thing shot right by, you didn't see it. You didn't see it. They've sinned, standing there buck naked before God. Put on some aprons, pitiful aprons. You know, so when you think about it, see, Adam was about what, 14 feet tall. Uh, they said that he, uh, the, the scientists have figured out that a man that tall weighs, weighs the same as an elephant, a modern day elephant. So Adam weighed about a ton. Muscular, well-built. We described him last night. He was a hunk. Adam was a hunk. <laughs> Eve, fine sister. The Bible says that he was, she was made. She was made from the rib of Adam. You read that? Hebrew don't say that. Hebrew says she was built. Come on, brother, and celebrate for five minutes. <laughs> Let the brothers raise their hand. Yes! <laughs> says she was built. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. So here they are, fine as wine, hunk and built, walking together. But now they're buck naked and, 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 and stay with the pastor. Now I'm setting you up for something. And, and, and here they are now. And so, and so they have to, they have to, they have to make themselves aprons. Remember that? Fig leaves. Now people that size out. When they got done with the aprons, there was a couple of fig trees that had no leaves left on them at all. Now, now, here we go, here we go. God is upset. Genesis 3 is going to prepare you for Revelation 13. And in the process of handing out his consequences and punishments, here is what God says in Genesis 3, Genesis 3. Yeah, 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 here it is, here it is, here it is. And to Adam, verse 17, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Do you see it, saints? And have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field in the, come on, say it, sweat of your face. Now, get the picture, get the picture, brethren. See these fine young men sitting here, get the picture. Before sin, work was fun. Yeah, Adam and Eve worked because they wanted to work. 
dug because they wanted to dig, planted because they wanted to. I mean, it was, there was no pressure, no bills. Could somebody just pause and say amen? No bills, no life insurance, nothing fell apart, everything worked, no health plan because they were made to live eternally. Just take a bite from the tree of life and every pain and ache and potential cancer was cast away every time they ate from the tree. So there was no pressure, no strain. Life was just fine and smooth and, and work was a pleasure and a joy and nobody worried about owning anything. Nothing wore out. Nobody could take it from you. You didn't pay anybody for it. Sly Satan set the human race up where that suddenly, because of sin, they now, watch it, were put in a situation where they had to survive. That's why you have a job. Somebody's honest out there. That's why you have a job. You have a job. So you can do what? Survive. Don't be afraid of the word. To do what? Survive. You want to survive. You want to survive. You want to survive. Pray for me now. These knees ain't worth a dime. <laughs> yeah, we want to survive. We want to survive. And, 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 and you work and educate yourself. So you can make money. So you can. And, and, and if you lose a job, you worry about your survival. It, uh, watch me. It has all changed now. I put some things in my notes. Not only, not only, not only did they have to now, 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 now worry about survival, but now there's inequity. Some people have, come on now, some people have less. Is that right? Some people ain't got nothing. So now this engenders greed and jealousy. They don't say, mm, like that. You know what I'm talking about. You check people out when they walk in our PC. What kind of clothes they got on. You know you do. Her shoes. His suit. And there is a tendency toward envy, even amongst God's people, and we measure each other. Lord, help us! We measure each other by stuff. Am I telling the truth? Sin brought that on. And now, because of sin, there's now mismanagement of the earth's resources. Oil, gas, and so forth. People fighting over this stuff. Are you listening to me? In the meantime, along with that, now comes ego. Because since I do have on a suit that was bought by my wife for me, and it's nice all matched up with a, with a, with a, with a tie and matching handkerchief, picking up the white and the white shirt. Come on, y'all. And the blue and the blue tie. Come on, y'all. Yes, sir. Now there's a temptation for ego. Yeah, put on the suit, get a different walk. Yeah, watch me now. I'm setting you up, setting you up. He invades the church, not with smoking, not with drinking, not with carousing, not with fornication. He invades the church with stuff and comparing each other by stuff and worrying about stuff and tempting us just in case, just in case we don't have enough money to buy stuff, then we rob God of tithe and offering and we give less money to the building fund. It, 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 and we don't even notice it because we don't smoke, we drink, we don't smoke, we don't break the Sabbath, must be doing fine. You're a robber in God's eyes. And it all started in the Garden of Eden. Let me get my notes. Let's miss something up here. Garden of Eden. Yes, 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 yes. Egotism. Egotism. Dominance. And then, and then lack of stuff created insecurity. I know I don't have clothes like some of the folk at RPC. So I come and I sit in the back. Ain't had a new suit in years. My shoes are turned over. Park my car in the corner of the parking lot. All these BMWs and, and, and Lexuses and, and Mercedes and, 
and first class Fords and so forth and so on. And you know, it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing about this, uh, Kayla. We, 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 get, we get this kind of stuff in our head and, and don't sit there all pious and act like you're not bothered by this. You know what you do. I can tell when you just got your car because you get out of the parking lot at RPC, rest of us with old cars, we get out, we walk, not you. You shut that door and you. Come on, y'all, am I telling the truth? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, when you have the old suit on, you sit in the back, but now that your wife done dressed you all up, yes, sir, find the front row. Usher says, right, here's the seat. No, 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 going down. I want to be seen. What I'm saying to you is that this stuff is infective. It's, it, it creates a mental disease. Are you listening to your pastor? See, why did the Lord bring this young, dynamic, professional, talented congregation to my neighborhood? Why are you here in old stage subdivision? Why is there now a large, talented church in the city of Bowie, full of God's truth and the remnant church and the remnant message. Why are you sitting here knowing the Lord is coming soon? Because God needs somebody who can overcome the disease of self and ownership and stuff and show the spirit of humility and grace and sharing and mercy who do not measure themselves by suit and tie and car and house and carpet, but measure themselves by the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's why you're here. We got enough stuff loving, puffed up people in this neighborhood already. We don't need more. We need now people who, if necessary, will give their last dime. That's what I said last time for the cause of Jesus Christ. We need people who will not shade on God. See, I've been watching you. I keep up with records. I watch the tithe and mission statement. When you all moved here, you were the third highest tithe paying church in the conference. Then you built this church and inherited debt. And I've watched tithe go down. Where is that tithe? You're shading some of you with God. You're taking tithe and you're justifying it and using it to pay building fund. Deciding you can make decisions about God's money contrary to God's plan rather than being willing to sacrifice. Go on and give that honest tithe. Give all the tithe like you used to and then sacrifice one less suit, one less pair of shoes. Done got quiet. I ain't getting no more amens in this building here. Let me see what I can find some of these notes where get somebody to say amen. Why? Why does God want to test us there? Because ladies and gentlemen, do I have to tell you again? I've been saying it for 50 years. Must I say it again? All this stuff we try to hold on to, all this stuff we own, all this stuff we fixed up for ourselves, all this carpet, all these drapes, all these cars, he's going to burn up every last one of them things. So you might as well, by the grace of God, sacrifice now for the cause of God. Because if you stay in this church and you're faithful, the day will come when you won't be able to buy and sell anyhow. That's going to be rough on some of us. See, I have mall disease. I have mall disease. Yeah, it's a newly, I've been diagnosed by my wife with mall disease. I think if I go to the mall, I must buy something. Don't sit there and look at me all pious. Come on now. Got to buy something. I'm in the mall. Stores are full. How are you going to go to the mall, brother, and come back just like you went? 
buy something, a shirt, tie something. You sitting there looking at me all pious. Fact is, a lot of us got mall disease. Come on now. Some of you got, some of, <laughs> some of you got Macy's disease. And <laughs> I'll get them stretched out in owning. And you know, I, 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 I laugh at Seventh-day Adventists. Pastor will preach a sermon, talking about the last days, how things are going to be rough. God's people are going to be persecuted. We're going to run to the rocks and the mountains. Everybody say, amen. You ain't never lived in no rocks and no mountains. You wouldn't know what to do when you got there. Watch the pastor. Watch Satan begin to work on your mind and make you think, maybe I don't have to run. Maybe I don't have to give it up. Maybe I don't have to just take a strong stand on the Sabbath. God understands I'll just come in a little bit on the Sabbath. I'm not going to, when the, when the law is passed and those who don't have the mark can't buy and sell, maybe God understands I've got to pay my bills. No, you don't have to pay those bills because now you've come to the time when God's going to wipe it out. Can you really walk away from that split level? Can you really walk away from the two stories? Now, in case you misunderstand this part of my sermon, there's nothing wrong with owning nice stuff. No. Since he's going to burn it up, give him something to burn up. Now let me drive my point home, because I'm coming to you. Let me drive my point home. But when you reach the sad point of measuring yourself by that, to the point where you're tempted to cheat on God, so in Revelation 13, the Bible identifies this power. It's a composite power in verse 1, part bear and part leopard and part lion and makes it a beast, a duplicate of the four separate beasts in Daniel 7, the bear, the lion, the leopard, the indescribable beast. And then that beast makes war against the saints of God, Revelation 13, 5, and 6. And then that beast hobnoth with another beast that caused fire to come down from heaven out of God. And then those two beasts begin to bring pressure upon God's people. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You may not believe it, folk, but we are near the day. I said we're near the day. I said we are near the day. Thank you, brother. I wouldn't do that to your handkerchief. I got this one. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, we're near the day. We are near the day. And you need to be getting yourself ready to say goodbye to your stuff. Y'all were pitiful. I'm going to get this group over here. I need some help, y'all. We need to get ready to say goodbye to our stuff. This thing is real. I've been preaching for 52 years. And I thank God for the fact that now he's showing me the signs. He's putting the stuff together. I can almost hear the sound of angels' wings. The last look at Orion, the, 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 the people on the telescope said, it's getting larger. It's opening up. They see more light coming out of Orion. Hey, my God is getting ready to come down here. He's not going to wait on people to decide. You got to decide right now. It's Christ or nothing else. House, land, cars, nothing, nothing but Christ Jesus. Your house. You got a mansion coming up. Your house. Your car, you're going to fly. Hey, 
What about your car? Your clothes? White robe. One color. <laughs> One size. Come on, somebody. Fits all. No splits. No drops. Somebody say amen there. Hey, not going to be any competition. When we go to church in heaven, not going to be seeing what you're wearing. Just look at myself. You got on a white robe. I got on a white robe. Mine's loose. Yours is loose. Hey! So don't worry about that stuff. He's trying to get you ready. And so he says in Revelation 13, I'm almost done now. Jesus paid it all. He's been preaching all day. We've been here all day. And so Jesus, hear the pastor. Isn't this a good sermon? It's a good sermon. Old brother came up with a good sermon. Right out of God's word. In God's word, he tells you, young man, the day is coming. You won't be able to buy and sell. He's trying to tell you the day is coming when you must cut loose from this stuff, cut loose from ownership, cut loose from egotism, cut loose from pride, get humble like Jesus Christ, know that he will take care of you. Don't worry about this stuff down here. Thank God he allowed you to enjoy it for a while, but the time is coming when you, and the day is coming when we will no longer care in the new heavens and the new earth everybody's going to be dressed alike everybody's going to have a mansion nobody's going to have any bills no health care needed got one tree with leaves for the healing of the nation somebody say amen out there no electricity because there's no night there the son of god shall be the light of that city Ain't no water problems. There's a stream. I've seen it in my mind running from the throne of God. Clear as crystal. No pollution. No problems. Hey, hey, that's where I'm going. I don't need to worry about buying and selling down here. There's nothing down here. I'm taking up there. Let it go. Let God take it from me. And he's going to take it from you. If you live to see Jesus come, and some of you will. I'm preaching to people right now who will be alive when Jesus comes. Now don't count out this old guy. I'm 73, but I'm in great health. Don't mess with me. Energy, full of it. Type A, personality. Alpha male, don't mess with this brother here. So I may last, I may last, but when he comes, some of you are going to see him. But before you see him, he's going to strip you of everything down here you own. You will run to the rocks and mountains. Ellen White paints it. Some of you will live in caves. Pray that I wind up in the cave with somebody who knows some scripture, who can sing some hymns. Would y'all get ready now? Because I know a lot of scripture, but when I get tired, I want you to say something in the cave. He's going to bring us to the point where all we have is Jesus, and that'll be enough. And those things in heaven he'll provide for us, free. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. I need somebody to celebrate Jesus right now. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed me. Why this snow? Jesus has paid the price. And so Henry, when I get there, I don't have to worry about having a credit card or any special introduction. Christ will just take my hand and lead me to what he has prepared for me all these days. And the idea of buying and selling will be a joke and Satan will get tricked. Let's trick him. 
He thinks he's got us. Oh, no. He ain't got us. I saw a number in Revelation, the seventh chapter. He don't have us. Robert, I saw him. How many did you see, John? I saw a number. Hey, which no man can number standing on the sea of glass. That's you. That's me. We going in. Somebody say, I'm going in. We're going in. Praise God. Pastor's tired. Sing. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Sing the song. I ain't gonna lose my soul over no stuff. Devil's not gonna backdoor me. I like my house, I like my cars. Got me a pickup truck, all souped up. Pastor put dual exhaust on his truck since I last saw you. That boy rumbles. God's gonna burn it up. Don't burn it up. And I don't plan to be around to watch it melt. Somebody say amen. Yes, sir. He's not going to backdoor me. Is he going to backdoor you? It's time now to make our commitment to God's work, God's cause, to this community where you've been brought. So my first appeal is very clear, simple stuff. There's not a person sitting in this room that isn't attached to something that's material. It's just natural, folks. Don't feel bad about it. It's natural. You like your suit. You like your shoes. You like your house. You like your car. You like something. It's all right. It's okay. But I want to be sure when the pressure comes, when you cannot buy and sell, when God finally puts the heat on. I don't want to be sure, puts the heat on me. I want to be sure that I stand. I want to stand. I don't want to let him down. I want to, I want to see him. I want him to see me walk away from it. All right, God, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. House gone, car gone, clothes gone. But I will stand like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. I shall not be moved. I want to be that kind of Christian. What about you? Do you want to be that kind of a Christian? Stand on your feet right now. Second appeal. Second appeal. You're watching online. Your life is not straight. You're standing in this room. Your life is not straight. As I was preaching, you said, Pastor, for me, it's not the house, the cars. I got other stuff I'm attached to, and I know it. When you talked about certain things we shouldn't be doing, Pastor, I'm still doing it. I need help. There is for me the habits. There is for me the pornography. There is for me substance abuse. My problem ain't the car. Ain't the house. Satan didn't have to backdoor me. He hit me straight in the face. And I failed. Struggling, I'm struggling. I need help. And I don't want to walk out of this service today acting like everything is all right. I want to bring myself up here for prayer. Second appeal, that's you. There's something wrong. 
There's a cancer. You need prayer. I want you to come right now. I want you to come. I want you to come. Come on. There's no time to be faking it. Come on up here. Come on up here. It ain't right. God knows it ain't right. You ain't right. And today you're going to get right. So come on. Don't worry about what people are thinking. You can be a deacon, an elder, a deaconess. If you get on up here, if you need to get up here. Some of this stuff is tenacious. It's tenacious. And you pray about it. And you don't want to do it. And you make promises. And you keep on failing. God loves you. Raise up your chin today. No condemnation from heaven. God's arms are open wide to you. And my heart goes out to you. God will help you let it loose. Don't stop praying. Don't stop hoping. Don't stop wishing. I need my pastor up here. What's Pastor Graham? Oh, bless your heart. Okay, I understand. I understand. I know where we're going. I know where we're going. I'm with you, Pastor. I'm your servant today. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for these who've come. That's just the second appeal. It's the third one coming. Father, precious saints are here. Trusting you. They're not concerned right now about whether the name is on the roll or off the roll. What they're concerned about is their relationship with you. Even if they stand, even as they stand here, they're trembling. Because the thing that brought them up here is so strong in their life. And they want so bad to be free. They want to be free. Something's got a grip on them like a tiger and it won't turn them. They want to be free. I'm praying for freedom, Lord. Somebody needs the cerebral cortex cleaned out. There are pictures there that don't belong. Somebody's got something in the very pores of their body, the very cells of their being, and it cries out. It's stronger than they are. It seems to be stronger than their prayers. Clean them out. Lord, would you hear us today? Jesus, will you hear us today? and save somebody from themselves. I'm pleading for those who've come up and for those who should have, for those who should have. Give somebody victory right now. They don't need to go someplace to be cleaned out. You clean them out now. They don't just need therapy, they need Jesus. Would you possess somebody right now? Would you possess them? And maybe one of these people standing up here feels your tug so strong. They want to go into that pool with Pastor Graham before they leave today, signifying victory. I leave it between you and them third appeal you need to join the church <laughs> you need to come back to the church and you're here now those of you standing up in front of me I want you to kind of part some of you move this way some of you move that way I want you to part because I, I got a third group coming now you're going to take your stand today you're going to come forward to me and you're coming forward for baptism, for Bible study. You're going to make a decision today. If you're here, come and move in front of me. Come and move in front of me. I know this is the rough appeal. I know this is the rough. This is the tough one. This, this is the one you didn't plan on. Come on. Come on up. Right here. Pray, church. Pray, pray, pray. This is not about Henry Wright. This is a Christ moment. Give me another verse, Monica. While we wait. I 
need you to come. You're going to join today. You're going to prepare for baptism. You're not ready today. You're coming for a Bible study. You're going to come. God bless you, sis. God bless you, sis. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else. Somebody else. I want you to come so bad. I need the congregation to help me now. Monika, lead them in the course again. Everybody's singing. Jesus paid it all. Together, sing it. Lift up the song. Everybody's singing. now you still can come up those of you who came to the second appeal walk away claiming victory claim victory talk victory change some relationships places you plan to go this evening you won't be going phone calls you were going to make you won't make Walk away victorious, my brother. Claim it. Fight for your life like you were drowning. You hear me? Father, I thank you. I'm such, <laughs> I'm such a pitiful preacher, but I do the best I can. Thank you, Lord, for having mercy and using your servant again. Thank you for this wonderful service. Thank you for the word. We leave the place today. Satan ain't gonna sneak up on us with something subtle. We given it all to Jesus today, everything. From the socks to the drapes, from the house to the car, from every secret sin, we're giving it all to Jesus today. When we walk out today, Satan has no territory in me. Nothing in me is more important to me than Jesus Christ, my Savior. And somebody online is texting right now their decision. We thank you for it. Pastor says 10 people have already texted in saying Jesus is theirs today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name. And the people said amen. amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Give God glory as you go back to your seat. Put your hands together. Give glory to God.